Okay. All right. So, um, welcome everybody to the presentation, the ICUDDR webinar on creating college um, or university standards and substance use disorder education. Uh, this is actually a sort of a joint webinar with partners, um, the National Addiction Studies Accreditation Commission, um, and our two speakers are um, on the Board of Commissioners of NASAC. Um, we are actually, we're, we're, we've been in discussions with uh, NASAC uh, for, I don't know, several months now, um, thinking about how we can work together um, to have conversations with universities internationally about creating uh, standards uh, internationally. So I'm really excited that we have this presentation this morning. Um, we have two speakers that are on the Board of Commissioners of NASAC, uh, Diane Sevening and uh, Jerry Smith. Um, Jerry's going to speak first. He is the immediate past president of the National Association for Addiction Professionals, um, NADAC, National, it used to be called the National Association of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Counselors, that's where the acronym comes from. Um, and he's the Chief Operation Officer at Valley Healthcare Systems. Um, and Diane is um, the current president of NADAC and an assistant professor at the University of South Dakota School of Health Sciences Addiction Counseling and Prevention Department. Um, so they will be speaking to us about creating uh, university standards and substance use disorder education. Jerry, go ahead. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess depending on what part of the world you're in, but uh, uh, we're glad to be here. And Kim, thanks for the opportunity. Um, over the next hour, we want to share a good bit of information with you, but to give you some idea of what direction we're going in. Our first learning objective is we're going to describe the history of the National uh, Addiction Studies Accreditation, which is NASAC. Uh, our second objective will be to help participants learn the standards of NASAC uh, for college and or university uh, accreditation. And finally, uh, the third learning objective is for participants will learn the process uh, for NASAC accreditation, which uh, is one of the main focuses of this particular webinar. But to give you a little bit of background, uh, Kim mentioned that both De Diane and I uh, are longtime affiliates of NADAC, which is the Association for Addiction Professionals, which is based in the United States, and it's the uh, largest international membership and certification organization dedicated specifically uh, to the addiction profession. And we, we serve a variety of addiction uh, educators, counselors, and addiction uh, workforce, healthcare professionals. Uh, but most all of these specialize in addiction prevention, treatment, and education. And we affect, uh, have members, uh, over 100,000 members and constituents uh, worldwide who are wanting to work and create uh, healthier uh, individuals, families, and communities, again, through the use of prevention, intervention, and uh, quality treatment. To give you an idea of, you know, where we're coming from, uh, in 1998, NADAC uh, uh, adapted its current mission statement, which is to lead, unify, and empower addiction-focused professionals to achieve excellence through education, advocacy, knowledge, standards of practice, ethics, professional development and research. And we, we reach out in all of those uh, in a variety of different ways through the different bodies that uh, we are empowered and work with uh, throughout the United States and uh, internationally. To give you a, just a little bit of a focus uh, on where we're going, several years ago, we, we tried to concise exactly uh, the areas that we're, where we are and have been uh, addressing almost from our inception back in the uh, early 70s. And what we did is we designed NADAC's four pillars. And those four pillars, I'll, I'll go into them just briefly. Uh, each one of these is a uh, webinar in and of themselves. But we begin with our education and professional development. Even though individuals will come into this profession with a lot of times with background and education, because of the evolution and the ongoing change that happens within addiction uh, treatment, it's necessary and we, we see it as our one of our main goals and that's why it's listed as the first pillar, is the ongoing professional and educational development 
of, of our uh, membership. Uh, and we find that to be the strongest pillar that, that we have. Working with the populations that we do, uh, oftentimes they uh, cannot speak for themselves. So advocacy uh, around legislation nationally, uh, statewide in the United States or within local communities, uh, looking at legislation uh, and direction for healthcare, other healthcare professions or legislative bodies in terms of uh, action that could directly influence uh, the prevention, education, and, and treatment of the population uh, that we serve. One of the things we're really proud of that we, we do because we are the uh, Association for Addiction Professionals uh, in the United States that our main focus and our only focus is on a, uh, addiction is our, our membership through our affiliates. Uh, our membership uh, continues to grow as, 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 unfortunately, as the problem continues to grow within the United States. But we're also looking at what we can offer our membership in terms of current information, legislative awareness uh, through uh, affiliates. And in the United States, the way that's done is through affiliates that might be located within a particular state or region, depending on uh, how the, the body uh, is organized. Lastly is our credentialing and, and the standards around that. Uh, within NADAC, uh, we have the, the certification commission, which looks at the different levels, and we're going to talk about this uh, a little bit later when we talk about NASAC and our affiliation, NADAC's affiliation with, with NASAC, but within uh, NADAC itself, uh, we, we credential uh, individuals from uh, a non-degreed area all the way through uh, a master's degree area, and this is one of our uh, pillars in terms of being able to provide the profession uh, with knowledgeable, qualified, and certified individuals that meet uh, standards and guidelines as set forth uh, through TAP 21 in uh, the United States. But we'll, we'll look at that and we'll look at how that blends into what we do um, along with, with NASAC. Again, NADAC provides a variety of services, but our 10 main services are membership, credentialing, outreach and technical assistance, marketing, uh, advocacy, as I talked about, education, training, and provider program. Uh, NADAC has a huge uh, volume of educational materials available. One of the things we're, we're most proud of is uh, our library of webinars, which are free to any individual member or non-member uh, through, through NADAC's website. Uh, we have a product line. We have regular magazine and newsletters that, that come out monthly. Uh, we have special projects focusing around uh, primarily Recovery Month and then our trainings. Uh, we have an annual conference in the United States, but we also do regional trainings uh, that we're affiliated with uh, throughout the United States uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Okay, now to get to, to some of the meat of what we want to talk about, and that's workforce development and where education and uh, uh, accreditation fit in. Uh, back in uh, the early 2000, uh, NADAC was involved, and I was personally involved with the uh, uh, Practitioner Research Network study. Uh, it was made possible through a grant through uh, SAMHSA and CSAT. Uh, and what this allowed us to do is at a time where uh, a lot of addiction treatment was being provided, but what we were trying to do uh, nationally is get a focus on the depth and the breadth of the problem and who all was providing that within the different uh, counseling disciplines. Uh, we knew it had to be addressed uh, as a, primarily as a public health problem. You know, we wanted to make sure it was delivered by credentialed licensed professionals and uh, we wanted to also make sure that the benefit for the alcoholism and drug program was on that individuals that were being treated were being treated fairly. So we were looking at uh, parity with other healthcare coverage, looking at treating addiction uh, 
treatment and rehabilitation the same as we would any other physical health problem. So we were, we were looking at the scope of that throughout the United States. Um, what ended up happening is we, we found that, you know, NADAC was and has been a leader in promoting legislation uh, to support the development of the needed workforce. What we found through this um, particular research uh, that we did is that uh, our workforce was beginning to gray out. Uh, people were leaving the profession for a variety of reasons. Uh, the need and the demand for more qualified treatment professionals were out there. So we saw the need for, and it continues, we see that need for an expanded um, workforce uh, in the addiction profession. One of the barriers that we saw was that there was not enough uh, tuition support uh, and re reimbursement for that tuition. And we began looking at legislation that would lean more towards doing that. And uh, to that end, we fought for and received uh, some of the first funding for minority fellowship programs, which are now in its fifth year, but it, it, you can see from beginning clear back in the early 2000s, we're only in our fifth year of being able to provide um, this type of uh, reimbursement for uh, uh, advanced education. Uh, we also uh, looked at what was going on uh, nationally at that point in, in terms of people coming out of their own recovery and where they fit into uh, the actual uh, continuum of care for treatment. And we began looking at and developing uh, specialized certification for, for what we call peer recovery specialists to work primarily in conjunction with treatment professionals um, in that uh, continuum of care. So again, we go way back to uh, the late 1990s and early 2000s, beginning to look at uh, the problems that we're actually uh, taking head on today, which is uh, workforce development and, and where that began. And what we do know about all of that, that it, uh, it, it begins with looking at uh, having uh, credentialed uh, individuals uh, available to enter into the workforce. So under the banner of NADAC, um, uh, the International Certification Commission operates as an independent body for all matters involving associations, substance use disorders, Council of Certification, especially endorsements, opportunities at the, at the national and international level. What NADAC has done almost from its inception is, is tried to coordinate nationally and as it's uh, led to internationally, how we can have uh, standardized credentials for individuals that are uh, providing uh, treatment, whether at the uh, entry level all the way up through a license, uh, uh, master's and, and or doctoral level. What we saw grow out of that is that uh, looking at higher education, NASAC accreditation began in, in 2011 after NADAC and NCASE uh, joined their higher education approval programs to provide a single standard for higher education addiction studies focused program. Essentially what we wanted to do is we, rather than have two separate bodies out there with two different sets of standards, we bring these, we brought these bodies together and NADAC is specific to the accrediting addiction studies focused on education programs. And that's the meat of what we really want to, to look at today. But to give you that back door history of how NADAC being a leader uh, and having all of the membership and, and guiding um, uh, the treatment focus in the United States, joining that education process. Because what we were finding is people were coming out of uh, different uh, treatment uh, disciplines with very little educational background in uh, addictions treatment. Very strong therapeutic intervention skills, but oftentimes not having uh, the cognitive skill set that goes along with uh, with addiction treatment. So what we were looking at is wanting to look at, based on the competencies, knowledge, and evidence-based practices as have been laid out uh, by SAMHSA. Uh, NASAC is only one of those two organizations that accredits addiction studies-focused 
programs uh, in the United States. Uh, NADAC, NASAC is the only accrediting body uh, that accredits all academic degree levels for addiction studies focused on education. So that takes us all the way through associates, bachelors, masters, um, up to doctoral. And we'll, we'll break those down here in a minute to show you what a lot of those um, standards are and what the uh, coursework that's involved at those different level, levels are. Uh, NASAC accredits institutions of higher learning to provide this addiction and prevention uh, programmatic education to students. And, and again, Diane's going to talk a lot about that process and how uh, we accredit uh, higher ed institutions for, for, for providing those different skill sets. Um, NASAC is really proud to say that currently we have 30 programs uh, across the United States that are accredited. Uh, we have several more right now that are uh, in the pipeline uh, for looking at and uh, achieving this, this NASAC uh, accreditation. Uh, we'll, we'll keep coming back to this, but a lot of the information around our accreditation is at the, uh, the website, uh, nasacaccreditation.org slash accreditation slash NASAC accredited programs. That'll keep popping up, but it's, it's, um, it's, where, it's the, the body of where all of this information that we're talking about uh, this morning will come from. So let's look at the different uh, levels that, um, that the National Standard for Addiction Studies academic programs that we have. The first level, which is essentially the, the entry level, is the certificate level one. And this is meant for professionals with high school education or in the United States, which we call a GED, which is the general educational development for someone that didn't complete high school but went back and tested through it at a high school level. We're finding in, in the United States that we have a, a huge body of individuals that can and want to, to be involved actively uh, in the recovery process, uh, but perhaps don't have the education, but have that lived experience perhaps uh, of their own recovery. And this is a, a really good entry level uh, for an individual that, that wants to come in at that. But again, even coming in, you've got to work outside of your, your own recovery. So there are foundations that, that we need to look at in coursework related to this for the certificate uh, level one. Again, this is not um, institution-based. This would be uh, certificate level based within an organization. But what we're looking at having individuals focus on is the foundations of uh, chemical dependency and addiction counseling. This is a general overview. Communication and chemical dependency and addiction. The pharmacology, knowing what all of the different drugs and uh, medications that are involved in uh, chemical dependency, uh, addiction, and treatment. Clinical screening, uh, what what and where they fit into that assessment evaluation and documentation process. Uh, cornerstone for anyone that's involved in uh, providing uh, at any level of uh, addiction treatment uh, is the ethics uh, in chemical dependency uh, and addiction. Uh, real important to understand uh, the role of uh, confidentiality and, and where that fits in and uh, boundaries around the, the different um, involvement that an indiv individual will have with someone. Uh, looking at health-related issues uh, that are common within um, the recovering community, uh, HIV, AIDS, STDs, and uh, the different types of hepatitis. And then a, a general introduction to counseling techniques. Remembering that generally at this certificate one level, there's not a lot of uh, in-depth counseling uh, that might be provided, but a lot's going to depend on the individual's uh, background and, uh, and skill set. Move to the next level, which is uh, a level two. And this is, an, in the United States, this is an associate uh, level degree. This is where an individual is going to be involved in perhaps a community college where they're going to come, come away with a uh, two-year um, uh, degree. Uh, it could be uh, an entrance level, depending on the individual, 
uh, to an academic uh, pursuit at a higher level, but at this point they're they're coming in at, at uh, the associate level. So uh, in the United States, typically that's at a community uh, college. Again, to to look at uh, the difference in the coursework that would be needed at this level becomes a little more advanced. It's going to be everything that was uh, at level one, but some additional uh, coursework, particularly around relapse and recovery, because this individual is going to be more actively in, involved uh, in uh, the provision of care. Not quite, depending again uh, uh, at what level they're going to be uh, certified at, they're not going to be, they're going to be providing a lot of supportive counseling services. But they're also going to be involved in group process, uh, and uh, whether that's psychoeducational, uh, it it'll they'll, they may help co-lead with a, a more advanced degree uh, individual. They begin looking at the family system, so they're going to they're going to get coursework around family systems and and how transgenerationally uh, addiction is involved, but also looking uh, at the uh, effect that it has within uh, the nuclear family. Also, also beginning to look at the multicultural aspects uh, and the special populations. Uh, and oftentimes at, at this level, there's going to be a practicum or an internship as part of their formalized education where they're going to go out and spend time embedded in uh, some type uh, of addiction treatment program where they're going to experience firsthand uh, and a lot of it just may be that. They may just be involved in terms of uh, sitting in on groups, being involved, sitting in on its assessment, but they're going to get outside of the classroom and, and be involved um, personally in um, uh, treatment intervention. Looking at the more next more advanced level, this is the bachelor's degree in chemical dependency uh, or addictions counseling. This, this is meant for professionals who want to demonstrate an undergraduate degree level proficiency uh, in addiction-focused study. And again, this is going to be in a college or university that has a program specifically accredited uh, around the standards for uh, a bachelor's degree. They're going to have their generalized uh, coursework uh, for a bachelor's degree, but then you're going to begin seeing uh, coursework that is designed specifically around, say, the principles of chemical dependency, clinically, clinical screening and assessment, evaluation, documentation, the pharmacology, the ethics, the theories of chemical dependency, the multicultural aspects, uh, looking now, beginning to look more at counseling skills around chemical dependency, the theory of practice of group counseling. And again, this more advanced degree is going to put this individual into a situation, into a treatment setting at, at that part of the continuum where they're going to actually begin providing direct care. So they need uh, practice around the, uh, the different uh, theories involved. Uh, and also what it means to, to counsel chemical dependent uh, individuals uh, in, in a family system. Also always looking at the recovery support uh, system that goes along with working with an individual programs that are going to be offered uh, mutual support programs outside uh, of the continuum provided within uh, a specialized program uh, recovery services in the community uh, anonymous fellowships uh, for both uh, the individual and the family um, and most oftentimes it's going to be tied to uh, this individuals are going to be again in a counseling practicum internship where they're going to it's going to be required for them to go out and be actively involved uh, in a uh, treatment setting uh, typically focusing on the area that they may want to specialize in whether it's residential outpatient uh, working with minority groups whatever but there's going to be uh, a structured in internship program uh, that comes along uh, with this particular uh, degree level. Moving right along, the next one is going to be the master's degree, and this is meant for professionals who want to demonstrate at a graduate level uh, proficiency. 
this is where be, uh, it's a typically a two-year program, and the focus is going to be, uh, besides the general coursework that has to be done at, at a master's level, there's going to be, again, that uh, introduction to chemical dependency and addiction counseling. Now we're going to be looking at uh, the psychopathology and the psychopharmacology, because, again, we're looking more and more at a more in-depth therapeutic uh, intervention process for this individual, because oftentimes they're going to be, they can, they are going to be at a stand, they're going to be at a level where they're going to be able to practice uh, independently. They're also going to begin uh, looking more and more at the co-occurring dis co -occurring disorders uh, that go along, oftentimes go along with an individual uh, that is uh, addiction, uh, that is addicted, whether or not that's, you know, a, a bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, borderline personality disorder. It's looking at all of the possible co-occurring disorders that could happen uh, in addiction. Again, also looking at the multi multicultural aspects and, and the special populations, uh, course working around cultural diversity, theory and practice of group counseling. Again, may have had some of that at the bachelor's level. If they didn't and they're coming into it for the first time in their um, master's program, they're going to get more in-depth uh, training around theory and practice. Uh, the same thing would be true for counseling chemically dependent uh, uh, individuals and uh, around the family system. Having to remember, oftentimes people may come out of an undergraduate bachelor's program that have never been exposed to any of the specific knowledge skills uh, uh, that that they are going to need if they're going to get this master's degree in chemical dependency counseling. So they're going to pick up some of these at a at a more advanced level. Then they're going to be involved also in the practicum or internship. This is going to be a little different where they're going to be infused into a um, uh, treatment setting where they uh, may actually be assigned, again, depends on uh, the program that they go into, where they're going to be assigned clients uh, with oversight from uh, a clinical supervisor uh, that monitors and works with them reviews their work and oftentimes even signs off on the work they do during the time that they're in this internship uh, and practicum as they work towards their uh, fulfillment of their, their master's degree. So obviously you can see as we progress from the non-degree to the associate to the bachelor's to the master's, the, the skill sets that are needed in this standardized program uh, that we've worked with is getting individuals at the highest possible level of uh, experience as they uh, exit their uh, educational program. Last, but certainly not least, is oftentimes, uh, we and we have some programs at a doctoral level, and this is meant for individuals who want to demonstrate it at a doctoral level uh, the proficiency. Uh, again, they'll, they'll pick up all of their normal coursework or a doctoral degree, but they'll, they'll also be picking up the, the co-occurring, uh, the process addictions, uh, more advanced theories uh, in treatment of addiction. Again, depending on what doctoral program uh, they're going to be affiliated with coming out of uh, that particular discipline. And this one, this at this level, uh, doctoral level, they'll actually uh, be involved with uh, in a residency where they're going to be infused into a program for uh, an extended period of time where they're going to uh, get uh, more firsthand, uh, more independent work uh, in providing uh, education, uh, providing ongoing uh, therapeutic intervention. And again, all of this information that I'm going through rather quickly uh, can be found at uh, the NASAC accreditation uh, dot, dot org, a, a lot more in depth. Uh, when NASAC came together initially, uh, we were looking at all of the stakeholders uh, that were out there that we were dealing with trying to, to bring together uh, uh, all of the global recommendations. So, you know, what we wanted to be looking at is the creation of more addiction-specific degree programs in colleges and universities uh, across America. But now, 
wanting to share this with you all and looking at it from, from an, uh, an international um, uh, standard of practice. And uh, again, we, we believe we have a lot of what, it, what needs to happen. So, you know, we want to create uh, those worldwide uh, standards. And one of the things that we, we want to do is, is not just look at, because they're, they're, they're rather checkerboard uh, approach in the United States, and we're still trying to pull together uh, an, an overall agreement on, on the standards. And that's why NASAC has kind of taken this leadership role in pulling all of the standards together, uh, coming up with an accreditation process and trying to get uh, colleges and universities at all these different levels to begin looking at, you know, the standards that, we, that we've put together and get some agreement that through this accreditation process that we can, that we can create a qualified uh, body of uh, individuals that are competent uh, at these different levels, uh, and they are all different levels that are multi-skilled and provide a variety of care from an entry level all the way through uh, at a doctoral level. And what we're wanting to really promote is the ability for people to enter at, at any part of uh, that continuum of care. They could stay at that level or they can advance based on their own uh, need, desire, uh, or interest. Finally, one of the things that um, uh, SAMHSA and NADAC and NCASE uh, have put together is to give you some idea of, you know, like I said earlier, where individuals can move through this uh, process depending on uh, where they enter and what they're, um, what they're wanting to do uh, in the uh, in the continuum of care. Um, so, quickly going through this, uh, what what you'll see is depending on again the level that you enter at. Uh, let's take the high school where you'd have the high school level. It's an entry level, but you know why would somebody want to enter at this level? Well, here are some of the career opportunities. Uh, you could be a peer recovery uh, support specialist. You could work in a court diversion program you could be a recovery coach. Uh, if you come in at the uh, certificate level, uh, which is an entry uh, at the SUD technician level, you could be an SUD counselor in training, you could be an outreach worker, you might be uh, an intern, you might work in a detox center, uh, or you might be a residential support specialist. Let's move up to the bachelor's degree. At that level, uh, you could be actually a certified uh, SUD counselor. Uh, a clinical supervisor in, in some areas at that level. Uh, you can begin looking at some managerial uh, responsibilities. Uh, and most importantly, uh, you could become, uh, you could come in as a, a trainer, bringing other individuals uh, uh, along in that process. The master's degree, which seems to be probably one of the uh, more highly uh, sought after areas and needed areas right now, is where you have an ind individual that is providing that direct care, oftentimes uh, independently, and depending on their uh, skill set and length of time and experience, they can uh, provide supervision and clinical oversight uh, to uh, other uh, SUD uh, counselors. So you see at this level, it becomes a lot more uh, specialized and based on uh, work experience and time in the profession, uh, the individual becomes uh, an, an administrator, educator, and oftentimes can go out uh, themselves into uh, private practice. Wow, I know that's a lot to have gone through, but I want to turn it over to uh, Diane now, who's going to uh, talk about why NASAC and, um, and begin looking at the accreditation process. Diane? Thank you, Jerry, <clears throat> and thank you all for being on this webinar with us. We really appreciate the opportunity to work with you and hope the information we provide will be of assistance. <clears throat> so after listening to Jerry and, and all of the history and the research that's been done, you may ask yourself, well, why NASAC? So I just wanna explain some of the benefits to colleges and universities. 
So probably one of the main ones is a clear communication of program standards because there's so many different programs out there, some trainings, some degreed programs, but they don't always offer the needed courses that are necessary in treating the addiction population. <clears throat> it also assists with portable and transferable certificates and degrees and networks. So if they wanted to move from state to state or even internationally, which is our hope, that they would have the necessary requirements <clears throat> along with um, the, the certification or licensure. Um, it's also a resource for the creation, expansion, and advancement of addiction curricula. And again, wanting the curricula to meet the needs of the population. So it, it really creates a bridge from classroom methodology. So everything they learn in the classroom, they're able to then put into professional practice. <clears throat> um, Self-governance of addiction studies curricula within higher education. So here again, wanting to standardize it so that whatever level they come in at, they're getting the same information. Um, and it, it is information that is current and up to date, which then again helps with continuous evaluation of workforce issues and trends, and then wanting to meet that need and making sure that the curricula um, actually applies to the needs of the populations. So here you see <clears throat> some of the main points why it's important um, to accreditate to accredit colleges and universities. And first of all, it's a great guidance in program development. Um, it, it assists all students and all programs in making sure that they are providing the um, highest level of education possible. Um, it's also a self-assessment to evaluate program goals, curriculum, strengths and weaknesses. And this is something that can be ongoing, which we found when we got our program accredited through NASAC that it really keeps everything in one place. And whenever we need to refer back to something or we need to update or we need to change it, we know exactly where to go and make our program even stronger. Um, peer evaluation um, is also necessary it creates the opportunity to receive feedback from educators of similar programs. And so there's that opportunity to exchange that information and say, well, within our area, this is what we see, and then <clears throat> come to terms, have discussion, and then make changes accordingly. And it's also a demonstration to key stakeholders. So the students, the legislators, future employers, and others um, and it shows that the program will meet or does meet the national standards. And, and our hope again is to expand it into the international standards. And then increasing the standardization of academic requirements for the addiction professional. So here again, wanting to make sure that everybody's on the same page and um, providing the, the most current up-to-date evidence-based information. So in order to go through the process, it um, is a step-by-step -step process. And again, based upon all of the research and the background that NADAC and SAMHSA and INCASE has done. So there is a packet, an application packet that's available. And so it's on the NASAC website and you can see the, <clears throat> the web link right there, so all the materials are available through that link. So once the person receives, or the institution receives the packet, then they will complete it and then return it um, to NASAC with the application fees. <clears throat> um, then once that application is received, then NASAC will select an evaluation team, and this evaluation team can usually consists of like one main reviewer and then two others. And these reviewers already have gone through the accreditation process and are NASAC accredited. And then the institution, once the committee has been selected, then the institution will prepare a preliminary self-study portfolio. <clears throat> So 
So here you see a, the step-by-step -step process. So again, once the application has been completed, then the self-study needs to be completed. So the evaluators have looked over the application. Now it's going into the next stages where they'll complete a self-study. And this is where <clears throat> um, the institution will reflect upon their, their program's mission, their goals, and whether or not it's meeting the national standards. And then again, to make, to demonstrate that um, it will meet the standards. So the program needs to provide the outlined information and supporting documents. And then once that has been um, provided, then it will be organized as indicated in the application packet. So it's a step-by-step -step process. It's a wonderful guide. You can just follow that guide. Um, just start at the top, go down to the bottom and it'll all be complete. And then once that's done, an electronic document is created and that contains all of the information from that guideline in the application packet. And then they send that self-study to the NASAC office electronically. And it's so much easier to do it electronically because then there isn't that chance or, or opportunity for it to get lost in the mail or for some things to be missed. And it just provides a much cleaner, thorough way to assess and evaluate it. So, <clears throat> Um, the NASAC office staff will send the evaluation team um, the application and then they will review it. So it'll be the three main individuals and then they'll do that within um, 30 days from receiving the application. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, the evaluation team consists of three people and then um, they will meet um, making sure that the institution meets the following criteria or, and the faculty from that institution. So they have to be a full-time or part-time faculty in a NASAC accredited addiction program, like I mentioned. Um, they must have completed the NASAC evaluators training and <clears throat> all evaluators have to go through the training once their program has been accredited through NASAC. And then they review the application and self-study and make sure that all the information is there, the information is sufficient. Um, and then once that happens, they'll inform the institution if the information is not sufficient. And then also they will provide information that is needed. So anything missing, um, so it's not like a, a one-time you're done, deal, you get an opportunity, or institutions get an opportunity to um, fill in missing information. And then the institution, once they've received that, of course, if it's, if it's sufficient and glowing, then they don't have to worry about it. But if there is additional information needed, then, um, then they can provide that information. And then, then they review the application and self-study and then assess whether the institution meets the NASAC standards. <clears throat> so this is some of the information that needs to be provided within that application process. So it is imperative that a portion and we encourage for all faculty um, to hold a state <clears throat> or national level licensure or certification. And then again, the hope is to have an international. We do have some international already, um, not um, through accreditation or through NASAC, but, um, and then be certain that all faculty resumes are up to date. And I know I'm guilty of this. I've, if I'm not applying for a job or I don't need to provide it, I have a tendency to not update it and, and put in my current information. Uh, again, the faculty must have educational levels appropriate to the classes they are teaching. Um, certain courses can only be taught by a master's level faculty member or a doctoral level faculty member. 
So they must make sure that they have the appropriate degree to provide that education. And then 50% or more of the faculty must be members of either INCASE or NADAC. And again, this is um, to make sure that the faculty is current and up to date with the most um, pertinent information to meet the needs of our patients and our clients today. So then when we look at the college and university program self-assessment, this really helps to identify any strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, which is known as SWAT. Um, and it, it really provides that information, um, not only to NASAC, but then also to the program itself um, to make sure that they are meeting the needs of what um, our, our workforce, our treatment programs, prevention programs need today. Um, and then again, the purpose is to build upon the strengths and then repair any weaknesses. So again, it really helps to set that higher standard in making sure that the students going into the program are getting that information pertinent to what they need today. And then um, our goal as a, an accreditation body is to strengthen and improve um, all institutions who are going through this process. Um, <clears throat> so why? Whoops. <clears throat> because this contributes to quality patient care, um, high quality of treatment and prevention, higher student satisfaction rates, larger student retention rates, and evaluates our um, entire profession. So then we look at the college university mission and goals. So this will be where it's the institution's um, goals. You wanna make sure that they're clear and concise. And usually they're in the United States, they're accredited through Higher Learning Commission. There's also regional accreditation for colleges and universities. So the, again, it um, helps to establish program curriculum, making sure that it meets the standards of a higher level of education. So the associates, the bachelors, the masters, and the doctorate. And then the goals for the program should directly um, relate to the mission of the program. And the program curriculum should demonstrate that the curriculum fulfills the goals and mission of the college or university. <clears throat> So then when we look at coursework and curriculum, um, a copy of all of the course descriptions. So there's the course syllabus, there's the outlines, there's the objectives on the syllabus, um, there's, there's the requirements, what students um, will learn as they take this course. And then um, in our experience, and I've been an evaluator, but now that I'm a commissioner, I'm not able to evaluate programs, but this is really the most time consuming portion to make sure that there is that consistency within all of the course syllabi. And then what's very helpful is the TAP 21 crosswalk. So the TAP 21 was created by SAMHSA and it really helps to make sure that each course is meeting the standards in providing the most current up-to-date evidence-based practice and information. So as the applicants go through um, the TAP21 crosswalk, then the reviewers will check each course and then make sure that this course or these courses meet the standard created through the TAP21. And then um, in just a, a minute, we'll be showing you examples of that crosswalk, but a lot of people will say, well, I don't have course, I don't have that many courses, but in many, in many instances, the courses may be used multiple times because in certain courses, you're gonna have ethics and you're gonna have the counseling and you're gonna have the um, assessments and intake. And, so that can be incorporated in, into one class, which you can use multiple times. 
So here you will see an example of or a few examples of the SAMHSA TAP21 crosswalk. So <clears throat> this is what the crosswalk looks like in all of the different areas, all of the different domains. So we've just put in a few here. The one, um, first one is foundations for addiction professionals. So it is important to understand addiction, um, making sure that they have a good basis of understanding of the variety of models and theories of addiction and other substance related problems. And then they also want to look at it, um, looking at the whole picture. So where they look at society, they look at the politics, they look at e economics and culture, and then making sure that those, that criteria is included within that course or courses. <clears throat> and then also um, under that first one, um, also describe the behavioral. Um, so you're looking at all of the health aspects and the social effects of psychoactive drugs. So that's really kind of your base course where you're giving an overview. Then um, another one is professional readiness. And this is where they, the course will prove that there will be an understanding of diversity, um, the ethnic cultures, they'll be looking more at a worldview, how they can adapt um, and understand uh, the needs and requirements for each of the cultures and understand how to communicate with um, the different populations and then also the special needs and how to be prepared for that. Um, and again, self-awareness is very important. We all have to um, incorporate self-care and we have to assess ourselves on a continuous basis to make sure that we're not creating harm and that we are providing care and <clears throat> um, meeting the needs of that patient or client. Um, and then um, it's very important to understand the addiction professional's obligation to adhere to ethical standards, as Jerry had mentioned, looking at the laws, um, and especially in regard to confidentiality, because that is <clears throat> very important to the individuals that we serve and making sure that we adhere to a professional code of ethics. Um, also, um, the importance of ongoing supervision and continuing education. So here again, because our profession is evolving and there's new research being done, it's important that we as professionals make sure that we understand that and that we are incorporating that within our, and then as faculty, making sure you're incorporating that into your um, coursework and so that when the student graduates, they can use it in their professional um, work. Um, another one is um, implementing the treatment plan. So here again, they want to collaborate with referral sources. So they need to look at programs that um, they refer to for internships, residency, practicums, um, work collaboratively, collaboratively with them. Um, and here again, through this particular um, component of the crosswalk, the student should make sure that they understand the nature of services, the program goals, program procedures. So they'll be looking at different types of modalities, treatment modalities, um, and then looking at how to do the paperwork, that dreaded paperwork that most professionals, addiction professionals dread, but that's very important. Um, they learn how to do um, treatment goals and objectives, um, looking at outcomes, um, and then um, what types of services are needed to make sure that treatment is successful. And then uh, the last example uh, is uh, documentation. And as I mentioned with all the paperwork, it is important that um, the counselor can demonstrate 
the knowledge of accepted principles um, and do client record management and, and that it's done in a timely basis. Um, they need to understand how to do accurate and concise screening intake and assessment reports. They will also be looking at um, continuing care plans, your aftercare plans. And again, it needs to be consistent with agency standards and, uh, and comply with applicable administrative rules. They'll also be recording the progress of the client or lack thereof and then making addendums or changes to the treatment plan with the goals and objectives. And then <clears throat> be able to prepare an accurate, concise, and informative discharge summary. And again, a current one, so it, it shows where the patient or the client is today, um, not where they were, where they are today, and that they had made progress. And if not, then maybe moving them to a different level of care. Um, so again, a constant assessment and documenting that um, constant assessment and use um, any accepted methods and instruments that are needed to make sure that the client's needs are met and that <clears throat> they will get become closer to recovery. So any questions or concerns? So we're, we are at the end of the hour, uh, but if you all are able to stay a few minutes, um, Diane and Jerry, then we can, uh, you know, anybody that has some questions can go ahead and ask them. We could stay on maybe another 10 or 15 minutes if sure. there are questions. Okay. Um, so folks, I have you all muted, but you should be able to unmute yourself if you want to, um, if you want to ask a question. There's a, a, a button, I guess, at the, probably at the bottom of your screen. Um, where you should be able to unmute yourself or on your, um, where your photo is, you should be able to unmute yourself. And if you are struggling with that and you have a question, you can type it in the chat box and Carrie or I will read it. I'll give people just a minute or two. Hi, this is Carrie. Um, my question is, is there someone who sort of can advise through this process? Like if you're working on this, can you work, do you work with someone specifically at NADAC or NASAC or is it just sort of, you're going to get feedback when you start sending paperwork in? No, there is the opportunity to um, meet with or to have a conversation with, to discuss anything with one of the commissioners who have um, gone through the accreditation process, or one of the evaluators who are not a commissioner. Commissioners don't evaluate, sorry. <laughs> so yes, there is that opportunity for right. them to have that guidance. Thank you. No questions from anyone else? So folks, we, this has been recorded, so you can, um, we'll post it on the ICDDR YouTube station, um, and we'll have a link to that from our website, our new website, which is icuddr.org.org. Um, we'll have a link to that. Probably I'll get it up uh, tomorrow or the next day, and so it'll be available. And if you want a copy of the slides, um, you can send Carrie an email. I think she's the one whose contact information is on the announcement and we can get you a copy of the slides as well. Um, so with that, since I see no questions, um, I guess we will close this webinar, thank our speakers. And I'm actually looking forward to, we are having a conversation about having a discussion section at our conference in July, which will be in Bangkok, having a discussion section about um, creating international standards, you know, discussing um, whether these need to be adapted uh, or there are other standards that we want to start from, but um, having that conversation about whether there's any interest in having this a similar kind of um, set of standards for universities 
um, internationally. So um, if you're interested in further discussion, we will hopefully be seeing you in July. Um, so thanks everyone. It's nice to see your faces, um, those that are on the camera, and um, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.